Welcome everyone. This is Mr. Simone again, and uh, today's video is going to be about the Vietnam War, and I must give credit to uh, Miss Poger, who is a social studies teacher up in Westchester County, who has a wealth of PowerPoints available uh, on her website, powerpointpalooza.com, for AP US and AP European history. It's a remarkable and very generous, generous um, offering from her. So I did use that for this, but the speaking will all be mine. So the Vietnam War uh, for the United States doesn't officially get uh, started until 1964, but unofficially we're going to go all the way back to 1954. And those of you that remember this from world history, the area that was called Indochina was controlled by France. Uh, Indochina today would be three countries, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. So uh, first the Japanese had control of it during World War II, but then the French uh, recolonized it following this time period. And then what will happen is the French will be involved in a conflict with the Vietnamese, and their movement for independence was successful in 1954. So the French, French are gone, and Ho Chi Minh will be the leader of this uh, new country, Vietnam. At the time, President Eisenhower was in office and declined to get involved in the affair. Okay, but then there was a conference in 1954, the Geneva Conference, in which they decided they were going to divide Vietnam at the 17th parallel. Now this is when you're going to have um, an internal civil war within Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh and his nationalist uh, forces against Ngo Dim Diem, who was uh, French educated. All right. Uh, they were supposed to have these elections that were going to unite Vietnam, but the elections were um, uh, corrupt and fraudulent and never really materialized. So this is what's going to lead to North Vietnam and South Vietnam being divided. Um, the U.S. military starts to get involved slowly just by sending in advisors. Uh, that will be the key role throughout the 1950s. Uh, by 1960, we had 675 of those advisors present. And then we're going to... And then in 1960, Kennedy will be elected president. He defeated Richard Nixon, who was Eisenhower's vice president. And he will increase the number of advisors tremendously. Um, there also is this somewhat of a conspiracy, possibly. But you know, on November 2nd, Diem was murdered. Uh, and uh, Nyo Dim Diem, who I told you before. Uh, and then three weeks later is when JFK was assassinated. So there are some people who think that this might be connected to people's desire for us to get more involved in the conflict. All right, so now the whole theory that you learned about in the last video of containment is based on the idea of the domino theory, that we're worried that if one country falls to communism, others would follow. This goes back to President Truman, 1947, I think, 48 is when China became communist. And now you're going to have the president after JFK, Lyndon B. Johnson, say that I'm not going to be the president who saw Southeast Asia go the way of China. So it's 1964, that is the key year. And in this year, there, uh, in August, there were two ships, the uh, Maddox and the Sea Turner Joy. These are U.S. military ships that were off the coast of Vietnam in the Gulf of Tonkin. They were allegedly attacked. Um, and uh, this leads to the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, in which Congress authorizes the use of military force to defend our interests. I will tell you there were only two people in the entire Congress, House and Senate combined, who voted against this. One uh, was Wayne Morse, and the other was Ernest Gruning. And I believe Wayne Morse was quoted as saying that he wanted to go on record that this was going to be one of the biggest mistakes in foreign policy that we had ever made. So as you can see, the number of troops continues to go up. And I, I feel like I went through that quickly. Understand the Gulf of Tonkin incident gives the president far more authority as commander in chief. It's very important for you to understand. So now look 
starting with Kennedy, but going into LBJ, look at how the troops number of troops deployed to Vietnam continues to increase. Um, and it, it started out as a ground war. Um, and you did start to see fighting. This is the first televised war. So the, the news was able to bring the conflict home. All right. And I probably should have put this up there earlier, but this is just a map of Vietnam so you can understand um, where it's located and the divisions between the North and the South. The air war was called Operation Rolling Thunder. Um, and I'm just going to go right past that for now. There are terrible images of the air attacks. The Viet Cong is the group that we struggled with tremendously. So uh, what you have to understand is how would an American soldier be able to tell the difference between a North and a South Vietnamese person? So as the North, uh, North Vietnamese infiltrated the South, this group, the Fiat, Viet Cong, made it very difficult for the soldiers to know who they were defending and who the enemy was. And there's just a few more pictures of that. Uh, I don't think you need to know who General Westmoreland is, although he might be disappointed I said that. All right. 1968 is the key turning point year of the war. It, it starts, in this year, by the way, um, which you all know, we're on the 50th anniversary, but there's a tremendous um, list of key events that happened in 1968 uh, on the... Uh, 40th anniversary, by the way, the AP exam actually had this as a question. So could be again on the 50th anniversary. The North Vietnamese uh, launched a surprise attack. So it was the Vietnamese New Year, Tet, and Americans figured that it would be time to celebrate. We'll celebrate anybody's New Year's. Um, but the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong secretly attacked U.S. bases uh, in South Vietnam. It was not the most horrific um, military defeat, but because it was all on TV, this is what people say leads to uh, increased protests throughout America, as more Americans realize that maybe this war is not going as well as planned. So the Tet Offensive is very, very important for uh, on the home front. All right, and that's another map. Uh, okay, so now as the protests continue, here's one of the slogans, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? And you're going to see protests on college campuses and in big cities throughout America. And I'm just going to keep moving down. The popularity for Johnson went from 48% to 36%. I do hope you remember the Great Society. That was LBJ's popular liberal platform in which he created Medicare, uh, health insurance for uh, the elderly, Medicaid, health insurance for poor people. He really tried to build up our cities. And his Great Society program got dragged down tremendously by the Vietnam War. Okay, so it's so bad for him that in March of 1968, he announces, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as president. And this was shocking. So now we have an open presidential election with no sitting president running. And as this is taking place, morale starts to drop. And I think it's important for people to understand that the soldiers, and we will talk about the draft in class, but the soldiers were expected to serve for one month. I'm sorry, one year. So if you're planning on being there for one year, your goal is survival. And it may not be to, to, to be the most uh, influential soldier. And that makes it very difficult for the commanders to run the campaign. Okay. And then also in 1968, uh, this incident, the My Lai Massacre, I explained to you how difficult it was for people to know who the enemy was. And this was a village in South Vietnam that was bludgeoned. Uh, we don't know exactly how many. I've read 400 people who were killed. It did include women and children. And it's known as the My Lai Massacre. Now, we didn't find out about it until, I want to say, maybe 1970 or 71. William Calley was the leader who uh, took the fall for it. The soldiers said they were just following his orders. And if I remember correctly, he was convicted, but he really only spent maybe a couple of months in jail. But the My Lai Massacre is 
again, when more Americans learned about this, the support for the war declined tremendously. So here are some pictures of the protests. Colombia, there's one famous one that I'll teach you about shortly. All these anti-war pins, uh, make love, not war. Uh, this, this is the peace movement, uh, sometimes referred to as the counterculture movement. But the Vietnamese, the Viet Vietnam War really did galvanize uh, young people, uh, and not just young people, but uh, people who were against the war tremendously. Uh, here's another one. Hell no, we won't go. All right. Uh, so now you're going to have to sit back and listen to this. So in Chicago, in the summer, it is the Democratic Convention. I hope I've taught you that both parties have their conventions. Today, it's more of a party formality. We already know who the candidate's going to be, and it's a big celebration of his or her platform and agenda. But back then, there was times where we didn't really know who was going to be the nominee. So what I did not teach you in this uh, PowerPoint is that in June of 1968, Bobby Kennedy, and I'll go over him in more detail in class, but Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, and he was one of the leading contenders for the Democratic nomination. So what you're basically left with is you have the vice president, uh, who was Hubert Humphrey, running against the anti-war candidate, Eugene McCarthy. And they're both the Democratic candidates for president. And outside of the convention center, there was a whole group of young people. Uh, they called themselves yippies. And they were protesting against the war. And they were in the park outside. In addition to that, you have um, telephone operators who were on strike in Chicago. I think you have taxi cab drivers who were on strike. So there's, and the mayor, his name was Richard Daly, there's tremendous tension throughout the city. And these protesters, uh, they had like a, uh, a press conference where they nominated their candidate for president, and his name was Pegasus, and he was a pig. Uh, and they said that if Pegasus is not elected, they threaten to lace the water supply of Chicago with LSD. Um, and they said when Pegasus does become president, the White House would levitate from the ground, and we would get out of the war. So this is what's going on in the park outside the convention. Remember, the media is there, and, um, and the mayor wants the cops to remove them at 11 o'clock. Well, they refuse to leave. So at that point, the cops come in. I will show you this in class, and it becomes a very violent confrontation. Uh, and one of the chants becomes, the whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. I think I'm going to take credit for this. That was the chant that our fans at basketball games started to uh, recite when kids were taking foul shots for the opposing team. I do believe I deserve some credit for that. But all of this shows the chaos of the Democratic Party, and the beneficiary of it was the Republican candidate, Richard Nixon, who was vice president you know, eight years earlier, and he's going to win this election. I'll go through this more in class, but I just want to give you the, ba the background. All right, so now, in addition to all these protests, you have, um, I don't think Muhammad Ali made the slideshow, but you should know about Muhammad Ali, who was stripped of his heavyweight, um, heavyweight title for protesting against the war. Uh, he was a religious, a conscientious uh, objector. But Jane Fonda, an actress you may or may not be familiar with, we can talk about her in class, she is one of the most divisive figures of this era. And the reason why people were so upset with her is because she visited North Vietnam and she took a picture on an anti-aircraft carrier that would, you know, potentially be used against American soldiers. She did visit our prisoners of war as well. And then there's, there's some controversy. I guess, you know, we go back to the whole concept of fake news. But supposedly she said that the POWs passed her notes to give to people back home to tell them to support the anti-war candidate, Eugene McCarthy. I don't know if that's true. Then some people say that she gave the notes to the North Vietnamese. Again, that's never been proven. But there's just a lot of controversy around her. It still has, um, it still has you know, main, the, her legacy will always, I think, for some people, be connected to that, even though she has tried to apologize for any offense you may have 
inflicted. All right, the one protest that um, I would like you to know is Kent State. This was um, in Ohio, and the National Guard came in and shot four students dead after somebody set fire to an ROTC building. Um, that was in Ohio. There's a song, Ohio, that I'll play for you in class. Um, there was also a similar um, conflict in Jackson State and Mississippi, where two students were actually shot inside of their dormitory, if I remember that correctly. But the peace movement was very, very prominent, and it, and it keeps getting stronger as the years go on. So Nixon wins, and now his, and I think we mentioned this in class once before, the concept of the silent majority. His argument was, you know, we think everybody is a hippie, and there's all these um, very outspoken radicals during the 1960s, but his argument was that more people were actually not hippies, and they were referred to as the silent majority. His policy is that we are going to slowly remove the troops from Vietnam, and that's called Vietnamization, and train the Vietnamese to fight this war on their own. However, secretly, he was bombing Cambodia, and we didn't know about this. I should point out, it's a lot of order, but that Kent State massacre, that protest was in response to Americans finding out about the attacks in Cambodia. Um, and one of the, I'm going to save Agent Orange for later. Okay, the Pentagon Papers uh, was a, uh, I think maybe a 7,000-page document that was written by the government. And it basically starts with the Truman administration, and it goes all the way through Lyndon B. Johnson, and it's all about how the government may have misled the people and Congress about uh, what was how the war was unfolding in Vietnam. So... Um, Daniel Ellsberg leaked this document to parts of it, I should say, to the New York Times. The New York Times wanted to publish it. Nixon, however, fought against the release of the Pentagon Papers, and this actually went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the New York Times, allowing them, I would assume, using the First Amendment freedom of press as their defense. I'll sh there was a documentary about this. Daniel Ellsberg was referred to by Nixon, I believe, as the most dangerous man in America. And I will go through that again in class. All right. There is a ceasefire that was agreed to in 1973. Henry Kissinger was Nixon's secretary of state. One of my former students' mother actually worked for him. I have a book signed by him, which I'll show you in class. Peace negotiations. There he is. All right. The ceasefire. We know what a ceasefire is. And unfortunately, South Vietnam did actually fall. Saigon did fall to the north uh, in 1975. Nixon was gone by then. And I think I'm just going to go through these. So uh, I've heard 4 million Vietnamese killed, but the um, teacher has three here. 58,000 Americans killed, over 300,000 wounded. Uh, the Great Society programs, as I told you. And really, I would think the, the long-term cost of Vietnam is that Americans really lacked confidence in the government. And you're going to see that tremendously in the 1970s. Uh, long-term impact, politically, 26th Amendment was ratified. This allows 18-year-olds to vote, I'm assuming. And we'll do the draft in class, but I am assuming people said if you're old enough to fight, you should be able to vote. And then let's make sure we know this War Powers Act. So in the beginning of this, I told you that the Gulf of Tonkin resolution allowed uh, the president to have more authority. Well, now the War Powers Act is going to limit the president's power. If the president wants to use troops anywhere in the country, he can do so, or she can do so, but he must do so and tell Congress he's done this within 48 hours. So you get two days to tell Congress you've done this. Now, at the end of that, he or she must get approval from Congress. If Congress does not give approval within 60 days, then the president has an additional 30 days before he must remove the troops, which is why a total of 90 days can be used without any congressional authority. This War Powers Act is going to limit the power of the president. I will talk to you in class about the long-term impact on Vietnam veterans. And that's where we're also talking about Agent Orange, remind me of that. 
And I think I'll talk about John McCain in class as well. John McCain was a Vietnam vet, so was John Kerry, a name you may or may not know. Still believe there are over 2,000 Americans that were never accounted for. Um, and uh, I think that's a nice little, uh, yes, I think that's a nice little overview. There's a Vietnam War memorial of uh, the Vietnam War. So I thank Ms. Pojev very much for the PowerPoint, and I thank all of you for watching this, and I promise I will um, add much more to it in class. Everybody have a great day or night, and I'll talk to you soon.